Hey everybody, welcome to season two of the Peoples and Things podcast, where we explore human life with technology. I hope you had a good summer. Producer Joe Fort and I had a pretty good summer. Did you have a good summer, Joe? Yeah, thanks for asking, Lee. I had a pretty good summer. I kind of internalized the belief that it was never going to end, but then here we are. I hear you, buddy. Me too. Onward and upward. We have some fun new things on the way for you, so stay tuned for that. This first episode of season two has got it all. It's got intrigue, it's got tragedy, it's got mind-numbing bureaucracy. I interview Wall Street Journal reporter and Pulitzer Prize finalist Catherine Blunt about her new book, California Burning, The Fall of Pacific Gas and Electric and What It Means for America's Power Grid. In her wonderfully reported book, and truly I believe it's the best treatment of this story we have yet, Catherine examines the decline of California's largest utility company that led to countless wildfires, including the famous campfire that destroyed the town of Paradise, California, killing 85 people. She examines in great and fascinating detail the human cost of infrastructural failure. And I know this will be hard for regular listeners of this podcast to imagine, but something that played a large role in this story was bad maintenance. Yes, you heard it, folks. Bad maintenance. For all kinds of reasons, I'm excited that this interview with Catherine Blunt is our first episode of this new season. We are happy to be back with you, and we hope that you've been doing well and that you're ready to get cracking again. Get excited. Catherine, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about the conversation. So, California Burning is uh, is one of those nice books whose uh, titles kind of tells you exactly what it's about. Um, at least if you've been following the news <laughs> about PGE, uh, PGE and E and California fires. Um, but when you found yourself in the position of having to kind of give an elevator pitch for the book, what do you tell people it's about, and what were you trying to do with it? Yeah, absolutely. So. You know, it is one of those companies that has dominated the headlines for for a number of years now. And you know, if you're kind of a casual reader of the news, you'll form some idea of what happened. Um, you'll have some idea of the company's culpability in starting a lot of fires in Northern California, uh, especially in 2017 and 2018. But to really understand how this company arrived in these circumstances, mm-hmm. you know, of having this uh, enormous risk that it needs to deal with, then and managing it quite poorly at times. It's, uh, it's a very complicated story, and to, it, it really um, spans 20 years. Uh, you need to kind of understand the dynamics of the last 20 years, not just within the company itself, but within California at the regulatory level and the, and the political level. Um, and there's an element of this story that goes back even 100 mm-hmm. years, because some of the infrastructure that failed and started these fires was truly 100 years old, and uh, you know just built at a, during a completely different era. And so... I wanted to weave all these strings together and just give the most comprehensive picture possible for someone who wants to truly understand the story in the in in, in great mm-hmm. depth. That's that's the hope. I think you do a great job at that. So, how did how did you in particular come to write this book? Tell us the story about yeah. You know. Yeah. So interestingly enough, um, so I joined the Wall Street Journal three days before the campfire happened. So I joined on November fifth, twenty eighteen. The campfire happened a few days later, and. Um, it was pretty clear shortly after the fire ignited that PG&E's equipment would be implicated in this because the company filed a short report with regulators that there was a, a disturbance on a line in the vicinity of the suspected ignition mm-hmm. point. And, um, you know, that's not a, that's not a, um, wasn't a solid conclusion at that point, but it looked like we were going to have a very big utility story on our hands. And so I worked very closely with two colleagues of mine to delve really deeply into kind of what happened to um, what happened immediately before what 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 led to the circumstances that caused the campfire specifically mm-hmm. which which occurred when a very old hook on a transmission tower broke and dropped a live wire that arced electricity into the steel tower that held it 
showered the ground with sparks and, and the, the fire was out of control within minutes. Um, so we did a lot of we did a lot of work on you know how did the company maintain this line what did it know what didn't it know, and then we tried to zoom out eventually and say you know to the points uh, we were talking about earlier, what other elements mm-hmm. of this story are relevant for understanding the risk PG&E faces as a whole, not just the the source of risks that led to the to the campfire. So um, we did some very good work. Um, you know, my, my colleagues are instrumental in that. Um, and you know, the work got some, some recognition and then there uh, ultimately came an opportunity to write the book. Um, I ended up being the one to spearhead it. And, uh, I really appreciated the opportunity to do that and to go deep in some things that we never touched on in our Wall Street journal mm-hmm. coverage. Um, and also just to expand on some of that coverage with, with more detail and, and anecdotes that hopefully, you know, brought another layer of, um, you know, detail and interest to the story. Um, so, you know, I, there are a lot of fires in your book. Um, and, um, in many, I didn't know about or ha- didn't remember anyway, but the campfire is kind of the hook for, you know, it's what we most know for, for good reason. So just, you know, in case listeners have forgotten about it or didn't really take rec- recognition of it when it happened, can you tell us just a bit about like the campfire and, it's kind of place in history. Yeah. Yeah. So in zooming out a little bit, fall is typically the period. Oh, it's, it's the height of wildfire season in California because um, there are weather conditions that result in very strong winds that blow from east to west. I'm in both Southern California and Northern California. And so what happened on November 8th, 2018, is that there were some very, very strong winds in the Sierra foothills in Northern California. Um, there was a hook on a, you know, the transmission towers are high voltage lines that carry power from generating stations to substations, which, you know, from there it goes to your house or your business. Um, there was a, a hook holding up a wire on a transmission tower. It had been installed about 100 years ago or 100 years earlier. Um, yeah, and it you know had weathered a lot of wind and precipitation over the course of decades. It was hanging from a plate, and as it swung in the wind, it would rock against the plate, and the plate would eat into the material of the hook, so that there was a very deep groove. And finally, during this particular windstorm on November 8th, it just broke. And so therefore, the wire that it was um, keeping aloft fell and hit the steel, the steel structure, um, that resulted in, you know, the surge of electricity that showered the ground with sparks. The fire ignited just beneath the tower and it was like it was spreading out of control truly within minutes toward the town of Paradise and it ultimately destroyed the entire town and killed 84 people. It was the deadliest fire in, in California history, which is why it's more well known than several other fires. But um, the PG&E's equipment has been implicated in a number of deadly fires over the last several years. So your your book begins with these two sentences. It's hard to say exactly when PG and the E Corporation began its fall. Like the erosion of any great institution, it happened slowly, and then all at once, as the weight of past mistakes came too much to bear. You you detail mm-hmm. how PG and E had deep roots going all the way back to the Gilded Age. So can you, I think mm-hmm. we don't we sometimes lose sight of these very long trajectories with these firms. So. Can you tell us a bit about that yeah. history and it's how it's kind of tied up with the development of Northern California? Yeah, absolutely. So PG&E, um, it was built probably over the course of about 10, 20 years, starting at the end of the, um, the end of the 19th century. Um, there were, this is, this is a time in when, you know, in which, you know, electricity is very much an experiment. Mm-hmm. You've got Thomas Edison doing his thing. Everyone's watching. Everyone's excited. Um, and then, you know, there's the um, kind of the race and the competition for the best transmission technology to be able to deliver, you know, um, power from power stations that could be built in more remote areas rather than right in the heart of congested, busy cities. Um, and so... The interesting part about Northern California is it is extremely rich in hydropower mm. because mm-hmm. there's a lot of rivers, you know, these, um, and there were some pi- early pioneers who looked at this and said, wow, we can, I mean, with the, with the right equipment, with the, we could harness this power 
create hydroelectricity and transport it all the way to San Francisco, where power demand was expected to increase very quickly. Or there was there was there was even just there was a population to mm-hmm. serve, right? And so um, and so it started with a couple of, of pine- PG E itself started with a couple of pioneering guys who were you know, trying to, they, they built some powerhouses. Frankly, I'm going to be honest, I don't even know how they did it because they didn't know what they mm-hmm. were doing, <laughs> but they did. <laughs> and, uh, and then they started buying up other little pioneering power companies, you know, creating a progressively larger company until it basically, you know, serves a lot of Northern California and it had one competitor, mm. just really just one. I mean, maybe, maybe a few others, but really just one. And, um, this was another company founded by men who were fascinated by hydropower and built out a very large, uh, very powerful hydroelectric network. Um, the, two, the two companies competed for a while because this was before utilities were widely established as regulated monopolies. Mm-hmm. That, that sort of regulation, that sort of idea is evolving during this time. And ultimately, as the each company sort of passed into the hands of new leadership over the years, they began to recognize the really the value of merging to create a monopoly that served almost all of Northern California. Mm-hmm. The two companies merged in 1930. And um, the transmission line that started the campfire was actually part of the network built by the, comp- the competing company, which is called Great Western mm-hmm. Power. And so PG&E had no role in building this network at right. all. Um, you know, and so... I think over the course of a hundred years, any company is going to kind of lose track of some of its oldest infrastructure, where it came from, who built it. But in this case, there was another layer of complexity in that it wasn't PG&E's right, to begin right. with. <laughs> and so that's kind of a fascinating part of this history. And, um, you know, kind of fast forward, um, the company exists comfortably as a regulated monopoly for decades, as do most uh, most every other utility an award-winning uh, um, regulated monopoly i mean it, you you detail that it was really successful there for a while oh, yeah. right yeah yeah so it uh it it it, it was really a quite po- following the merger you know it was very powerful yeah. um despite the fact that this you know occurred right before the depression but um after world war ii it had enough financial might to just embark on this really ambitious expansion plan that it, it completed and um, it got an industry award, um, and uh, gosh, it was called a Thomas Coffin Award for one of the co-founders of mm. GE. And um, so the, it was like it was the industry's highest award at the time. I believe this was in it was after this 1950s era expansion. Yeah. Um, and so you know, it was uh, it was a company run by a lot of proud engineers mm-hmm. for for many years. Um, then in you know the. The rest of the 20th century was pretty, ch- it became challenging, yeah. right? With like s- the run up in energy prices at various times, especially during the 70s. Right. Um, this big push to build nuclear plants. I mean, almost all of which had such massive cost overruns. pg e had one itself um, that, you know, was hundreds of mil- hundreds, billions of dollars, mm-hmm. frankly, over budget. Um, it made it so that by the 90s, kind of collectively, a lot of thought leaders are looking around and saying, you know, energy prices, electricity prices are too high. You know, PG&E was coming out of, excuse me, California was coming out of a recession. Um, what, you know, what if we deregulate this right. industry and make it so that it's subject to market forces in a way that it hasn't been in a hundred years. And, um, and so California was one of the first states to embark on this deregulation experiment Without boring everyone with the details, it really didn't go well. You do a well great job of talking <laughs> about, of writing about deregulation, by the way. It is a <laughs> extremely hairy topic, and I had, like, cold sweat flashbacks to, like, grad school when I had to study it my first year, <laughs> but I thought you did a great job of writing about it, so. <laughs> I appreciate that. I tried to keep the chapter as lively as I could. There are, there, <laughs> there are some characters, yes, at least. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so I guess uh, it was 1999, 1998, 1999 that deregulation takes hold in California, and so the, also just to kind of put simply, the utilities no longer own their power plants for right. the most part. Instead, these are owned by independent power producers who are going to sell power into this new wholesale market, this new competitive market, in which there's going to be this new practice of electricity trading. You know, very complicated because. Electricity is like, it is consumed the moment it's generated. So it's not something that can be, it's not like, 
you know, wheat or coal or something in which you buy it and can kind of keep it on the sidelines until it's needed. It's like, it's just a extremely fast moving, complicated mm-hmm. activity. Um, and the construct of the market was such that um, the utilities were prohibitive from charging above a certain amount to in, in retail prices to customers. Um, and so if wholesale prices rose above that retail threshold, they would have to eat that difference. Mm-hmm. And there was widespread market manipulation by virtue of the way it was designed. All these traders and other players in the market were just essentially gaming the system at a time when supplies were already short. So wholesale prices were going through the roof on a periodic basis and the utilities were having to to eat the difference of those costs. Um, Hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars and and PG&E ultimately sought bankruptcy Mm -hmm. protection. So um, that was a that was a super challenging time for every California utility, and PG&E was kind of the most prominent casualty of that experiment. And so coming out of that, um, the company kind of embarks on this effort to p- regain the trust and interest mm-hmm. of shareholders. Um, <sighs> utilities make money by making large capital investments, doing big projects, building things. Um, you know, like big doing big overhauls of the system, little projects, you know, maintenance yeah. projects, day-to-day operations, those are treated as expenses and the company doesn't earn a return right. on them. Um, and so that, it, it works in theory. Right. <laughs> in, in practice, it can be a really, utilities can have a tough time striking the right balance between what's the appropriate expense level and what's the, what's the appropriate capital investment right. level. Um, cause you know, the most adroit financial performers keep expenses relatively low and free up money to invest and earn, you know, money that on which they can earn returns. Um, but sometimes that means the utility is cutting too close to the bone and that's what ultimately happened during this period. The company was found to be shirking on gas transmission, pipeline maintenance, and it all kind of came to a abrupt halt in 2010 when a, when a transmission pipeline south of San Francisco exploded and killed eight people. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that ultimately led to this fascinating trial. The company actually went to trial over charges of violating the Federal Pipeline Safety Act. Um, It was found guilty on a lot of the charges, but the the trial really brought to light how collectively people within an organization can make decisions that inure to this catastrophe, um, even if no one person is ultimately culpable for the sort of decision making that ultimately leads to disaster. And so just to kind of, you know, fast forward and cut to the chase, um, the same dynamic played out on electric in terms of electric inspections and maintenance, not quite for the same reasons. The company was dealing with some other cost pressures over time and it wasn't necessary. I don't think it was quite as squarely attributable to the desire to please Hmm. shareholders, but that was part of it. Um, And then ultimately the campfire happened and just a year earlier, the company's lines had caused a lot of fires in North, um, the the wine country mm-hmm. area. And so between these two years, it owed billions of dollars in, li- in liability costs to those who were affected. The company ultimately sold, stopped bankruptcy protection again. And so your earlier question was essentially, how does an institution like this unravel slowly? It is, it's just, it kind of, it's one thing after another until all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> That they're staring down the barrel of thirty billion dollars, and you know more than a hundred lives yeah. lost. So that was kind of this, you know, gradually then all at once right. <laughs> thing that I yeah. Um, <laughs> gradually then suddenly, as they say, or whatever it is. Yeah, I want to talk more about this kind of like, um, you know, after the first bankruptcy, after the um, deregulation bankruptcy. I want to talk more about that moment for a second, or in a second. But first, I wanted to just say, like, you know, you point out that for a long time the company appears to have like done zero inspections of transmission towers. And when they did them, they were kind of half-assed, but even worse, mm-hmm. like in the early chapters, you have like someone in the firm recommending further inspections after some kind of problem popped up. And that recommendation was just like not followed up on at all. So clearly there yeah. was like a kind of pretty deep culture of mismanagement and lack of accountability 
in in the yeah. firm. So I just wondered, like, as you interviewed folks for this book, which, by the way, it's really amazingly reported. You have a large cast of characters that are all fascinating. You did a great job. But, like, as you're talking to these people, what are, you know, like, what are, how do they explain this kind of mismanagement and lack of accountability in the firm? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. And, you know, I want to be honest with you. It is one in which I wish I had a better I wish I had better perspective on how some of the people who are closest to these issues would explain it. Um, Because there were a great number of people who I know to be, to have intimate knowledge of some of these recommendations, things that were not Mm -hmm. done, you know, and, um, and they really, really didn't want to talk Mm -hmm. about it. That was, you know, that was one of the challenges of, of reporting a book like this. And I think that, you know, it stems from a few things. It's, you know, this is a very litigious yeah, yeah. issue generally, yeah, right. right? And so there was like a lot of litigation yeah. ongoing. There was like, you know, strong recommendations from their attorneys not to talk to anybody. Um, but I also think there's just like, from what I can gather, I mean, you know, if you're talking about the kind of the, the, the engineers and middle managers who had the most intimate knowledge of some of these issues and what was done and what was not mm. being done, yeah, you know, these are, you know, people who have spent probably their whole lives in Northern California. They may have had other yeah. family members that worked at PG&E. You know, they're, they're people who they do care a lot. And I think that, you know, the few that I did talk to, I think there was a real palpable sense of kind of guilt, sadness, and perhaps confusion mm-hmm. as to how things went so wrong. Yeah, um, that's interesting. The closest, I, the closest I kind of have to seeing a lot of people talk about something like this in different ways is um is it was the san bruno trial there were a lot of this these types of employees who were brought forward to testify mm. and the testimony each of their testimonies were um i mean in aggregate they were very complex you know this is this ultimately you know the in some ways inspecting and maintaining pipelines is, is in, and trend and power lines for that matter is straightforward in other ways yeah. it's really not you know, and um, and there's a lot of different layers of complexity, and I think that there's a few things that were evident to me. Um, you know, some of the, some of these employees, you know, they're so steeped in the kind of like, well, is it by the book? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what the right, book right. says. Standard, you know, we don't yeah. have to. We don't. We don't have to do. You know, super close right. inspections. We're not being required to do that. We're doing exactly what upper management is mm-hmm. telling us to do, and upper management maybe isn't aware of um, the fact that these things actually warrant much closer inspection. And ultimately the, the the middle managers and inspectors don't really know that either in some cases because they actually haven't been out there doing the close inspection. So it's just kind of this, you know, um, lack of knowledge. It just keeps getting exacerbated year mm-hmm. in and year out. And the other thing too, is that um, to the extent that they know they're cutting corners, I think that, in doing that, they just they they feel it's justifiable and defensible, but they don't know the full scope of the risk. Uh-huh. So they don't know how their decision is playing into how the risk is much greater than they perceive yep. it yeah, yeah, yeah. because they don't have all the information. And so you know they're like we were cutting corners, but this didn't seem to be like it was a huge problem because they lack the full visibility across the organization to know that maybe someone over there is also cutting corners and someone over there is also cutting corners. And so then it accrues into something that's much larger than than them and the individual decision that they made. So this is, I think one thing that is, um, in terms of those who are closest and and who were most involved in some of the really poor decision-making, I don't think there was a great deal of ill intent, yeah. you know, I don't think, but I do think that in, in both the cases with San Bruno, as well as what issues were ultimately discovered on electric transmission, there were very, very clear pressures from the top to reduce yeah. expenses in the form of inspections, mm-hmm. essentially. And I think that, you know, upper management is very culpable and not understanding how that pressure is going to manifest in problematic right, behavior, right. you know, or problematic practices. Yeah. And so I think that 
there should have been more accountability mm-hmm. there to know that if you're pushing down expense reduction, where is that coming yeah. from? You know, and so um, it's if you want to, you know, install new technology so that you only need five people in an office instead of 15, that's different than reducing inspection frequency to the point where you're not looking at for, you not you're not going to recognize the problems until mm-hmm. it's too late. Yeah, and you had some really clear examples like where the, the incentives like pushed the guys on the ground away from reporting leaks and stuff, which is like exactly what the opposite of what you want, right? But it- <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was a weird there was a weird thing in which they I, it's it's one of those things in which you know it's probably a well intended incentive right. program to try to improve it leak just distribution pipe leak reporting, but um, it was poorly designed and so. Um, it ultimately acted as a deterrent for reporting. And then there was, yeah, a lot of problems uncovered later as a Great. result. So I think what we were just talking about connects to this kind of post deregulation moment um, more than I, than I expected. But so what I wanted to ask you about is, you know, some of the scholar, scholars I follow are uh, very interested in like shareholder value, this theory of governance, you know, corporate governance that pops up in the 80s and 90s where you know, corp, the, goal, the goal of the corporation is to maximize basically the stock price and value for shareholders, right? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, you have a, more than a chapter, but a chapter that really centrally focuses on uh, Peter Darby, who becomes CE, mm-hmm. CEO of PGE in this post-bankruptcy deregulation moment in 2005. Yeah. And he's focused on transformation. That's like in quotation marks, right? Which is like, Beautiful business transformation, yes, business transformation, <laughs> which is like beautiful innovation speak. It's really of the moment that to be focused on this. Yeah, very much so. Um, and the, and the consulting firm Accenture is brought in to help with the business transformation. And it recommends a number of cost cutting efforts. So you describe how these transformation efforts kind of led to a neglect of day to day activities, including um, inspection and maintenance. So, you know, like, yeah. Is, do you think they, I mean, you were kind of already talking about this, but do you think they realized what was happening or was it was it exactly what you're describing where they're making these big business decisions at the top to try to, you know, make profits and, uh, you know, do stock buybacks and stuff like that. And they didn't realize what's happening at the bottom. Is that kind of what you think is going on here? Generously, yeah. yes. Okay. Like, I, I don't think, I mean, I think that, it's hard to make a blanket statement that they didn't know yeah. anything, but I think it's fair to say they didn't know the mm-hmm. extent. Um, and so it is interesting when you see, so, you know, I mean, theoretically business transformation makes mm-hmm. sense. I mean, a utilities mm-hmm. business practices are often, I mean, across the board, utilities have adhered to very out, out of, outdated, you know, yeah, outdated exactly. practices over the years. Yeah. And so I think that there's, there's been ample, ample room for improvement. Mm-hmm across the industry. And so, you know, the right strategy could potentially be very beneficial for the company, for shareholders, for customers. And so I think that theoretically business transformation was supposed to to help with yeah. that. But, you know, you see these these consultants come in and they're they're like, okay, well, you're trying to, you know, reorient the business and you want to please your shareholders. And so if you want to please your shareholders, you have to have more money for capital. Let's look at expenses. Yeah. You know, they recommend like, you know, big cuts out of expenses, out of electric transmission, out of gas transmission. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you've been, your spending there has outpaced the rate of inflation over the last several years, which is like largely an industry metric. They're like, so bring it yeah. down, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, okay, but how? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, and I think that they, they offered a, a number of ideas. It was, it was a technology focused um, initiative. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the technology uh, fixes that they tried to implement. I think the problem was, I mean, I don't think they were probably the right fixes. I also think they probably tried to move too fast and they didn't have a holistic understanding of, of PG&E's um, system and how everything worked together. One thing that was made very clear to me in talking to just workers who observed this was that they weren't asked to like give input as to what would be uh, yeah, helpful totally or not. Classic, so you basically yeah. have, <laughs> yeah, you have these consultants coming in and be like, we can fix your problems, but they don't even know what the problems right, are, right, you know? Right. So, um, <laughs> and, uh, so, um, so ultimately the business transformation effort ends being a total bust. It's really expensive, you know, um, in reporting for the Wall Street Journal, you know, I had a colleague, Rebecca Smith, who was super instrumental in, in piecing together mm-hmm. a lot of this. She 
covered pg e back at that time and remembered some chattering about this and did a lot to flesh mm. it out um, for our coverage and, you know, found a lot of some of the details of that effort that, you know, are reflected in the book. But, you know, she was the one who spoke to Darby for some of our earlier coverage and he pegged the cost, I think, at $300 million. I've heard it was more mm-hmm. than that. Um, but it's like, how do you even really yeah, measure, yeah. <laughs> though? And so... Um, uh, it was it was a lot of lost mm-hmm. money, and um, so it ends up incurring more costs than it ultimately offsets. Workers are really upset, and um, and it seems as though in some of those years um, there was you know some cuts or some issues on gas distribution, mm-hmm. um, which are like you know small pipes that feed your home. In two thousand seven, was it two thousand? 2007, 2009, somewhere in that time frame, um, a distribution pipe within a house, um, or not within a house, in the yard of a house outside of Sacramento is leaking gas. Um, The homeowner uh, or a neighbor reports, you know, smelling gas. It takes a while for the workers to get there. And and like, you can't make this up. By the time there's finally like a a worker on site who's measuring the, um, you know, the, the concentration of the leak, like at that moment <laughs> that he realizes it's a combustible concentration, the like someone within the house lit a cigarette and the entire it house had to exploded. be a teenage uh, and, teenager like sneaking into the bathroom to light a cigarette. It was <laughs> it was a teenager sneaking into the bathroom. Oh, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> Cannot yeah. make this up. I mean, it's like <laughs> anyway. So uh, so that kicked off this whole exploration of what was going on on the gas side. There were major maintenance problems. The company turns to focus to that. And so then you kind of have, um, so the company needs to ramp up spending on gas distribution. It has this faltering business transformation program. And so as it's ramping up spending on gas distribution, it starts trying to cut expenses from gas transmission. And so Mm. as that's happening, all these gas transmission engineers are kind of frantically trying to figure out how to run the business with substantially less money than they think Mm -hmm. they need. And um, they just, they simply say that, you know, the most effective means of trans- inspecting these pipelines, we don't have the funding. So we're going to be, you know, we're going to do less thorough mm. inspections and we're not going to inspect lines that have had pressure spikes, you know, and le- above a certain threshold, even though that was ostensibly against the law. And so, um, you know, ultimately that leads, it doesn't, you cannot draw a straight line between those choices and those actions and what happened after San, we were in the San Bruno explosion, this is where this gas transmission pipeline exploded. But more thorough inspection yeah. methods would have alerted to the company to some of the problems that this pipeline mm-hmm. had. And so that ultimately kicks off this investigation as to what happened on gas transmission and, and led to that big trial and its ultimate conviction. Yeah. I mean, one of the yeah. fascinating stories, I can't remember what chapter it is, is that uh, they brought in uh, a guy from Boston to... Uh, kind of redo the gas network and he did pretty impressive yeah. things but then you know he makes the recommendation you might want to look at the same kind of issue in electricity you know I'd bring in I can't remember some risk you know uh, consulting firm and they're like yeah uh, <laughs> we're good kind of yeah we're good yeah it's literally yeah. what happened yeah so what I mean why, why do you think that's um, all about yeah it's a it's a great question um, I think that well, I think probably that leadership within the that division probably felt that there was no need to go through the kind of hurdles that you need to go through to invite a consultant yeah. or a risk management consultant to do that kind mm-hmm. of work. Um, that was probably the prevailing sentiment. It's not just as easy as you know, inviting them to come sit with you for a day while you do your work. It's like, you know, you have to turn over yeah. a lot of books and like, let them do a lot of it. I mean, that's, it's a disruptive mm-hmm. process. And they probably felt as though it, that kind of disruption was warranted on the gas side after what happened. Yeah. There'd been no major catastrophes on the electric side. You know, why go through mm-hmm. the hassle? Um, just, just to prove everything is fine right. when everything already looks like it's fine. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, there, there may, I mean, there may have been, you you have to wonder if maybe there was some concern as to well, we don't want them to <laughs> come in and see kind of the, the messier side yeah. of things. You know, maybe if they had things to to improve. But I think that 
it's kind of, um, you know, I try to make a point that it really often takes a catastrophe to reveal the extent of the problems within any division yeah. within a company like this. I just think there's a lot of inertia and not a great deal of interest in trying to undertake substantial improvement when things are mostly working yeah. fine. So I think that that's probably what happened. This was around the time of 2011, 2012. The company hasn't had any catastrophic fires to speak mm -hmm. of. Its lines were igniting fires, but power lines ignite fires. Like that's just mm -hmm. sort of an inherent risk of the business mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, these fires are pretty easily contained. The forest hadn't been totally devastated by drought at this point. Um, it, it, the, the risk profile was very much changing, but I don't think anyone recognized the extent of the change to that point and how quickly it was going to accelerate mm -hmm. after that. Yeah, so, and, you know, that's probably some Yeah, to. and to be clear, like, you know, something you also do a good job of tracking in the book is that climate change is changing during this period too, right? I mean, the, the, circum the kind of rules of the game are changing. So they're encountering new situations that maybe they just ha hadn't thought through yet. Yeah. And, you know, I should probably qualify the, the previous answer to say there was a very serious fire in Southern California in 2007, mm -hmm. the witch fire. Um, the, the utility that owned the line, so San Diego Gas and Electric, um, it really sort of jolted the regulator right. awake, the California Public Utilities Commission. And shortly after that, the regulator launched a proceeding to try to, to you know, figure out how to um, reduce the risk of power lines starting mm -hmm. fires. And Southern California has historically mm -hmm. been at higher risk of fire than mm -hmm. Northern California because it's hotter and it's drier. Um, and pg and &E's attorneys success successfully argued throughout this proceeding that Northern California did not face mm -hmm. the same risk profile and therefore or did not have the same risk profile and therefore they shouldn't really have to have the same sort of stringent fire prevention requirements that the Southern utilities should mm -hmm. have. At the same time, they're becoming aware that things mm -hmm. are changing. There had already been an, a, there had already been a period of drought. There'd been a couple of years of really bad fires generally, including some in Northern California um, started by lightning and other things. Um, they commissioned a study to figure out how many fires their lines are actually starting. Um, you know, tree contact was a big problem. They, they discovered during this period. I mean, I think there was enough indications uh -huh. that it was probably disingenuous for them to say that they, mm -hmm. they didn't need to do much more. And if the, if, um, they have a suggestion to bring in Lloyd's as a, you know, to look at the electric side in the 2011, 12 timeframe, it's, that's a questionable yeah, decision totally. based on what yeah. they know. I mean, if you want to be, they, they could have been forward looking mm -hmm. and said like, you know, this, we have the potential for the risks that we know to be emerging to get mm -hmm. worse. Like, why don't we bring in a consultant or they could be backwards looking and say, you know, everything's been fine so far. And that seems, yeah. what, <laughs> seems to be what they did. Yeah. One of the threads in your story is, is highly ironic, and it's that as California state regulators came to focus on climate policy, they neglected to hold utilities responsible for safety. So spin this out for us a bit. How did kind of climate concerns end up butting against safety practices? Totally. So there's a, there's a few elements here that are relevant and sadly ironic. So around the time PG&E emerges from its first bankruptcy, um, California is starting to take a real interest in climate matters. Always mm -hmm. has, yep. obviously, but um, at the, around this time, it's becoming very viable to contract for large wind and solar farms and to reduce carbon emissions by with the build out of renewable energy. And so you have the state legislature begin to set targets for uh, carbon reduction and the utilities become instrumental in, in hitting these targets because their power generation sources are, because power generation is such a significant carbon mm -hmm. emitter. And so, you know, this is post deregulation, so they're not really building any power plants. They have to contract for the power from, from developers who are going to build wind and solar power. Um, and so at the time, wind and solar was so much more expensive than they are yeah. today. And so these contracts were, were quite pricey. Um, you know, the California utilities collectively really helped to create the economies of scale needed for projects today to be so much less expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so they were pioneering in that way, and that's that's kind of the hero story of this whole thing. But um, 
they're incurring a lot of costs. And so the cost of these contracts are passed on to customers. It, it, there's, you know, they're past their costs. They, they start to bear on rates. Um, so you've got, over time, as these utilities take on more and more contracts for wind and solar, there's additional pressure to manage expenses because these contracts are mm-hmm. expenses. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, so then there's that. So just by virtue of having that additional expense management pressure, you have the additional potential for cutting corners elsewhere as it relates to operations and maintenance. The other part of this is um, that within the, so that the California Public Utilities Commission is tasked with overseeing the procurement of this mm-hmm. energy, you know, overseeing the contracts. And um, this was a very, it's like for lack of a better term, this was the sexy right. place to be within the PUC. Like you wanted to, you wanted to be on the policy side of things. There's a lot of resources for that. There's a lot of interest in that. The legislature understood the need for that and was willing to allocate the resources to the mm-hmm. agency to, so that it could carry out um, those functions, less so for safety. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, in talking to a very long standing head of the agency, he was like, it wasn't glamorous. Right. Safety was not glamorous for better or for well, for worse. In this and case. it was small, right? It was like, it was it like just, 35 people for the whole state or something like that. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It might have even been less, mm-hmm. frankly. Um, and so um, they didn't have the means to have a true like oversight and enforcement yeah. program. Um, it's gotten better with time. But this was just, it was very much an understaffed part of the agency. They did not have the resources to hold the utilities accountable on almost anything related to safety. And so um, to the extent that you need that function, that regulatory function for this type of company, it didn't exist in nearly the way that it needed Mm -hmm. to for a number of years as a result of the emphasis on on policy Mm. and other things. It's fascinating. I mean, in the end, PG&E was criminally convicted not once but twice for being responsible for various disasters in the state. Uh, do you think, I mean, certainly, you know, they were convicted a second time, so the first one didn't do enough to change things. Uh, do you think the campfire conviction has really changed things? I mean, is it is it a moment of real transformation or, you know, or is it just another moment in this story? Yeah, I think I think it was a moment of reckoning. I think that it really forced the company to So when the campfire happened, within a month, the company sent inspectors into the field to look at every piece of equipment in in high threat fire areas. And they found a lot mm-hmm. of problems. A lot of problems. And so it was an indication that their ins- inspection and maintenance practices across the board had fallen very short for a mm. long time. And so they dedicated a lot of resources to trying to, you know, fix or quote unquote, make uh-huh. safe, <laughs> whatever make safe means. <laughs> but um, so in the immediate vicinity until they could get everything, everything fixed. And with that, they were trying to leverage technology. They used drones and other things to take pictures so that they could aggregate large amounts of data, use different AI applications to analyze it and, and get a better feel for what was actually going on. Um, all of this is happening during the time of the second bankruptcy, which is a really complicated Mm -hmm. process that, you know, you basically saw kind of financial vultures feasting on the company at at this time. Um, the, I mean, the restructuring ultimately, it wasn't great Mm -hmm. for the company. You know, the, the company, the corporate, the corporate holding structure didn't come out with an investment grade credit rating, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and, um, or either maybe, I mean, maybe the holding structure did, but the utility didn't anyway, suffice it to say that it came out more leveraged than it went in. And, um, you know, individual fire victims who were seeking compensation through this process didn't get nearly what they expected, yeah. um, really kind of got left holding the short end of the stick. And so the company's still working through a lot of issues, yeah. right? Even as it's been trying to come to terms with, come to terms with get a better handle on the risk, mm-hmm. get a better handle on what actually transpired and do more to reorient, reorient its processes so that it can do all it can to mitigate, to mitigate the risk. Um, that being said, I mean, it's really quite staggering when you think about the number of dead trees, the number of trees that have the potential to fly into yeah. wires, branches, debris, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
um, you know, a, a, you know, a, a hook that an inspector says was replaced and didn't mm-hmm. get replaced and uh, issues with records. I mean, it can just be any number of tiny little things that ultimately, um, you know, result in a catastrophe. And it, it's, maybe at this point it's truly accidental. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But what was interesting was a new CEO took over at the beginning of last year. Within six months, a little tree falls on a power line near Paradise, which was destroyed in the campfire, and it ignites the second largest fire in California history. You know, there's a lot of debate as to whether they should have removed the tree, was the tree healthy, Mm -hmm. all these things. But um, it's just like, okay, I mean, stripping all that away, this could happen sort of anywhere. (laughs) within the company's service territory. And so I think that what this, you, did the campfire change anything? I think it, it changed the company's uh, awareness mm-hmm. of what it's up mm-hmm. against, which is a huge improvement from before when it didn't know. But in terms of its ability to actually confront these risks and, and truly mitigate them to the point where it can operate without some of these extreme contingency measures, like shutting off the power right. when it gets windy and all these things. Um, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I think that after the second largest fire ignited last July, the CEO stood up and said, the risk is simply too high to operate the system as it stands now. We're going to bury 10,000 miles of wire. I think that's a great idea, right. theoretically. It's just going to be really challenging from a yeah. labor standpoint, from an engineering standpoint, and cost management. So it remains to be seen what they do yeah. on that front. There's, uh, I live out in on the side of a mountain and a valley outside of Blacksburg, Virginia, and... Um, the utility here um, has been really seriously cutting back trees from uh, the wires. And I've kind of wondered mm-hmm. at times whether it, the California story has led to some broader awareness uh, in, in utilities around the country around these issues. Because, I mean, if you see the cutback job they've done over the last year mm-hmm. along this one line, it's like, this is expensive and very serious. So something like something had to have led them to do this, you know, and I've just wondered if it, if it's the California story might be playing some role. Um, I mean, I mean, is there a credible threat of fire there is, yeah. where you live in terms mm-hmm. of what, the forest okay, fires, yeah. yeah. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. And so, um, you know, I think that, I, w- I mean, I would hope right. so. I think that, you know, at least a lot of the attuned CEOs are certainly watching PG&E and you know, they're saying like, oh, thank God, that's right, not me. Right. But they're also, I mean, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> um, I hope they were also, you know, um, I think, you, I mean, utilities across the West certainly yeah. face higher risk of fire. And I think are, you know, sort of beginning to experiment with some of the risk mitigation measures that PG&E took yeah. first, not first, but took at scale earlier than most, like, you know, shutting preemptively shutting off the power when wind picks up, um, you know, potentially more aggressive vegetation management practices. But I think that in general, so one thing that I hope is a takeaway from this book is that uh, some of this is unique to PG&E, but a lot of it is not. And so um, I was a little bit concerned when I embarked on this project in early 2020, that it would be hard to help a reader really understand that because there weren't like a lot of concrete examples of other utilities that were facing really steep challenges that were um, publicly Mm -hmm. evident, you know? And so, but you look at what happened in 2021. I mean, it was just kind of like one thing after another. It was like the Texas freeze and then heat waves Mm -hmm. across the West that stressed a bunch of utilities in different ways, you know, exceptionally bad hurricane season that knocked out all the transmission serving New Orleans. It was like, there was a lot. There was a lot going yeah. on in 2021, <laughs> and I think that um, smart utilities, smart CEOs, and smart boards are beginning to have conversations about the fact that, you know, the way that we've operated the system for decades collectively is not going to work anymore because things are changing. So what needs to change? What What do we need to do to change in mm-hmm. response? And so, um, so whether that be because they watched PG&E and learned something, or because they've detected changes within their own service territories, you are beginning to see, I think, some shifts in approaches Mm -hmm. to risk Mm -hmm. management. One of the things I was left with, I mean, I think you do a really beautiful job in the book kind of describing these different layers of kind of like structures and social structures and factors that are leading these problems. You have like the deregulation moment. I mean, even before we get there, we have this big bureaucracy that has kind of its own culture and is slow and 
has problems of record keeping. You have deregulation. You have this shareholder value moment where they're trying to transform the business. You have regulatory pressures. You have all these kinds of structures at play. And I think it really shows in a nice way how you lead to disaster. I guess I'm wondering, like, are you for after looking, thinking through all those structures, did some of them did? Was there like a factor you thought was the biggest driver of the problems? Or is it really the picture you want to get across is how all these things come together and kind of lead to the moment? Yeah, I think that, I mean, it's the le- the less exciting of the two <laughs> options, but I think that, I think really, no, it is, it's a confluence yeah. of variables, ultimately, and it's just, it is very hard to pinpoint one thing or the other. Um, well, no, yeah, but, it's, it's honest. I, I liked how your story is kind of free of villains as well, you know? I mean, you show a lot of people making bad decisions, but they're, when you write this kind of book, there's such a temptation to be like, there's the bad guy that did it, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's not here. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah, I, and, you know, I think that it, it really speaks to, it really speaks to the dynamics of the, of the circumstances. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, there are a lot of people making bad decisions, but very few who did so with ill intent. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is in some ways, it's just like, it's a, it's a failure of a lot of dip, different, it's, it's organizational failure and failure of imagination. Mm-hmm. And just, um, you know, it's, it's so much more complex than there, there's not a smoking gun. And one thing that I anticipated in trying to sell this book to publishers, I said, you know, there's, there's not that many heroes and there's not that many villains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that, <laughs> and I think that that's going to be a criticism that we receive. And I was absolutely yeah. right, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, and I said, this is an idea driven mm-hmm. book ultimately, yeah. you know, I think that some of the characters are great, but um, I hope that the value kind of comes away from not like a kind of a whodunit, but rather like, okay, here's, here are the ideas that you need to sit with if you want to actually think seriously about mm-hmm. these issues. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the right way to do it. I have to say, on some level, I found your the story you tell like deeply, deeply disheartening because there are a lot of individual yeah. is in the book, and there's business leaders and people are making bad decisions. But as we've just described, there's these enormous structures that are bigger than any person, right? There's the bureaucracy. Yeah. There's how regulations changing and how. Um, you know, how corporate governance is changing, which are much larger than all of us. And it was just like, even if I was going in as an activist or like a change agent or whatever and hoping to create change, it's like, this is a big problem that's hard to kind of shift the rudder on it. So I I don't know. I mean, not that it's a hopeless book because you do stop with underground, or, you know, like an end with undergrounding and possibilities, but it, it, you know, it gives you a lot to chew on and is kind of bleak in its own way. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's no getting yeah. around it. The challenges that this company faces are enormous. Yeah. Um, it's a huge service territory. They've got so much infrastructure. Yes. And it's really sad the speed at which the health of the forest deteriorated, mm. you know. And so, I mean, that's par- that's partially... It's a Mediterranean climate. It's cyclical by nature. There are going to be periods of protracted mm. drought, always will be. But some of this, I mean, it has a climate signature. Scientists agree that some of these droughts have been more severe mm-hmm. as a result of climate change. And so um, that is something that we have to grapple with on a global yeah, yeah, scale. Exactly. When you think about the consequence of that, I yeah. mean, it's just, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. And so I think that, you know, and I hope th- sort of to the point of undergrounding, the current CEO has estimated it could cost roughly $20 billion yeah. over the course of a number of years. That's a tough pill to swallow at a time when rates are very high. There's a wider conversation about affordability going on yeah. in California, specifically as it relates to utility rates. Right. Um, but is that just the cost mm-hmm. <laughs> that you have to pay? Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, and I mean, I, I, and I say that with like, I know that it can be really hard for some customers and utilities have programs in place to try to help those who really can't afford it, you know, and I, I'm not saying that it, that is an easy proposition mm-hmm. for any individual customer. That's not what I'm yeah. saying, but um, 
it's that's just a philosophical question it's like no matter how expensive it is, is is it just how the system has to be redesigned now you know critics especially those who are inherently skeptical of any large capital spending program proposed by a utility by virtue of the fact that you know they make yeah. a return on this um are gonna say like there's plenty of other solutions and that you could have more self-contained power grids, like more mm-hmm. microgrids, more distributed generation to reduce the need for all of this infrastructure. I think that that is true to an extent, right? I think that that's true to an extent. And so maybe you could have an argue, argument about whether you really need to bury a full 10,000 miles. But the question ultimately, I think, comes down to the fact that the system does need to yeah. be redesigned in a big way. What does that look like? And if it's going to be expensive, is that the primary consideration at this point? Right. I mean, think about the safety yeah, risk, yeah. you know, so. I know yeah. what you mean. I mean, it's it's like, um, you know, to broaden, back off a little bit and just talk about the broader conversation. It's really amazing to watch people freak out about gas prices right now um, for good reason, of course. And especially with affordability problems and all this, it really does put a burden on poor people. But when you think about the kinds of transformations that will have to happen for like same climate policy to take effect, you know, like it's going to cost money and it's going to raise prices and all these kinds of things. So I think it, you know, you're where you're kind of end the book is tied to these much larger conversations we have to have about transforming mm-hmm. our systems uh, in, in the yeah. face of climate change. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm glad your book does not end with a bullet list of the things that have to happen because I think that's like the dishonest, that would be the dishonest way to, you know, end these kinds of, you know, very large existential questions we are facing. Totally. If I had all the bullet points, I'd, I'd be in a different job, <laughs> I think. <laughs> so what, uh, what are you working on now? What's, uh, what's next for you? Well, I look forward, I look forward to it, it finally hitting the shelves. This feels like uh, it's a yeah. long fun process but uh so, so there's that kind of kind of get through that um you know I'm, I'm it's been a i mean just in terms of wall street journal work it's it's certainly an interesting time to cover power and renewables yeah. you know i kind of joke with people it only becomes more important every day but it's yeah. true i mean as we become more reliant on electricity and discuss electrification of more things um mm. you know try to work to combat climate mm-hmm. change um and also this particular moment of global energy scarcity between the war in Ukraine and other issues with supply chains, pandemic. Um, This is an extremely challenging time. Is I mean, the the challenges that we're discussing are hard enough kind of in a vacuum. And then you add the global energy crisis on all of it. It's, it's, it's tough. I mean, California is, has some of the most ambitious climate goals and the way they want to continue to transform power generation fleet and other things. Um, But it's been tough. I mean, there's, uh, you know, hydroelectric power hasn't been, I mean, over the last several years has been severely constrained by drought. Um, supply chain issues have made it so that certain renewable energy projects have gotten delayed and they're really trying to take a bunch of fossil fuel power plants offline to continue the transformation. So, um, you know, striking that balance is becoming more difficult. And that's a separate conversation from, from wildfires. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah, about, yeah. you know, en- uh, energy, energy supply and availability. Mm-hmm. Um. What I mean, like, what kind of articles are you writing these days? Mostly about that. Mostly okay. about all okay. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Issues. There's just the different challenges, and you know, um, it could be. So, with the with the grid, I mean, supply and demand have to be in constant right. balance, um, because electricity is generated the moment it's consumed. I mean, there are some exceptions as it relates to energy battery storage, but as an overall. Um, you know, percentage of the system, it's it's still a very small mm-hmm. percentage. So we don't have like a meaningful s- supply of electricity that can be kept in yeah. storage. Um, so, um, you know, in 2020, um, there were rolling blackouts in California for the first time since the energy mm-hmm. crisis, which the grid operator had to call for because um, demand threatened to exceed supply. And now you're seeing grid operators around the country warn that this could be imminent for them right. as well because for a lot of different reasons, but it all kind of comes down to managing the pace of the energy transition and making sure that what goes offline is fully replaced by something else coming online, wind, solar, and storage. And it becomes a more challenging proposition to do when you've got widespread supply chain issues and, and other things and challenges with building more transmission lines. Nobody likes that. And so, um, so uh, we could be 
potentially heading into a period over the next few years in which you begin to see more reliability scares or more reliability challenges, um, which, you know, has the potential to be really, really devastating yeah. for the energy transition, because even if it's brief and manageable from an, from you know, these blackouts, it's not going to do well. For yes, public yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, that's, I'm keeping a close eye on yeah. that. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's a wonderful book on a really important topic. So thanks for writing it. Thank you so much. I'm, I am very glad that you enjoyed it. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things, like most things in this world, depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother, Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy, Juliana Castro, for designing the logos for the podcast. Check out her work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and is supported by the Center for Humanities and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are hosted in the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Fort is the media production manager with Virginia Tech Publishing and serves as producer and sound engineer for Peoples and Things. Mandy Lamb is the production assistant. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you.